Let's bless them. Father, we thank you so much for this day. I'm so glad to be in this house. I'm so glad to be with your people. I bless each and every one that are here right now, those that are listening live, those that will be listening by TV broadcasts, by different media platforms. I bless the body of Christ. I bless the Ignited family. Thank you so much for all those who write and they pray and they support and they believe in this vision. Father, I'm looking forward to the day in heaven when we can all get together. But Father, right now I have an assignment, and I ask now that you would hide me behind the shadow of the cross in order that Jesus would get all the praise and the honor and the glory that is due his holy name. His name is above every name, and at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Father, I ask for you to anoint me, hide me behind the shadow of the cross so Jesus can be glorified. Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. And amen. Well, I have a, a, a word for you this morning and a, a message that the Lord spoke to my spirit. And I want to minister that to you this morning. And uh, as you know, I don't always get the easy assignments. Some preachers get Mary had a little lamb. Help me now. And uh, they get the little 30 minute sermonette that they got at the Dianette diner at or whatever and they just give it and they roll out and they go to the house and all that stuff but sometimes you have to plow let me try that again sometimes you have to plow if you're going to be a successful farmer if you're really going to get the seed deep and you're really going to have a great harvest and so I feel like that's the kind of message I have today but I am ready to plow here's the word of the Lord that he spoke to me he said the cloak of deception has fallen like fog upon this nation Confused and blinded by the lies of the elite, my people have become prey for the feast. This is the hour of exposure, revelation of hidden things, dark secrets, and understanding. I'm raising up my watchmen, my Paul Revere's of this modern day, those who will sound the alarm that your enemies are near and they are here. They are in your cities, your fields, and in your towns and in your homes hidden for an hour, hidden for a day to spring up, to move out with destruction in their hands and mischief in their hearts. Sound the alarm and raise the banner. War is here. War has come to this nation of deceit, and I will no longer look the other way. Rejoice, my bride, for all things are ready. All things are perfected in my hour of visitation. The title of this message was exactly... What the Lord spoke to me first thing as I was preparing, he said this, this name. He said, Paul Revere. Paul Revere. That is the title of this message this morning. And I asked the Holy Spirit to help me to articulate this. Because we're living in an hour in a day where deception is rampant in our country. We have people who stand in political places and people who stand in pulpits and people who stand in corporate power. And they continuously lie and sow a web of deception to our nation. And we find people that are in position of power that continuously peddle this deception. But yet the church stands idle and says really nothing against it, but accepts it. In fact, the church, the ecumenical church, the backslidden Babylonian pagan church... They help promote the deception. And one of the jobs I have as a watchman is to break that deception off of the church and those that will listen and receive the reality of truth. So he said to me, Paul Revere. And I said, Paul Revere, man, I, I know a little bit about Paul Revere. I mean, I, I, I was awake some of my high school days if I wasn't in detention or on my way down to detention hall or somewhere. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? But I said, Paul Revere, and 
he began to share with me and show me the reality is that it is the day and the time for preachers and for Christians alike to stop defending the deceit that is out there, to stop defending the deception that is out there and begin to preach the truth of the reality of the hour found in the word of God, not in the opinion of a man, not on a political mantra, but in the reality of what the word says and what you're seeing on the outside called life. We need some Paul Revere's. Now, Paul Revere, as you know, he was a man that was called by God really to be a watchman. On April 18th, 1775, he rode upon his horse in the midnight hour and he went and he declared not that the British are coming. Most historians have it wrong. He never said that the British are coming. He said the regulars are coming out. In other words, he was already in enemy territory. There were British everywhere. They were considered British themselves because American had not yet been titled or trademark upon them. So for him to say the British are coming would have been ridiculous. So he said the standing army was coming. The regulars were coming out. And so he did that on that very day. He says that he rode between 8 to 9 o'clock into the midnight hour declaring this secretly. He also was a founder and organizer of the, the intelligence service and alarm system of that hour. Most folks don't know that, but he did. He helped organize a watchman, if you will, type of brigade that looked out for the British. Are you fixing to see where I'm headed today? And the reality is that the people of that hour, they responded to the cry of Paul Revere. They responded to the cry that the regulars were coming out. In other words, there's an enemy that is coming. And the people of that day recognized and realized that there was truly an enemy out there. And they responded. And the militia responded. And the people responded to this cry. The difference today is, is we do not believe there's an enemy. And we do not believe the watchmen. We do not believe the prophetic intelligence. We do not believe the word of the Lord. We believe the word of a king. Man, I ain't going to have too many friends today. But I'm not really interested in being friends with anybody when a message is so important as this, that our enemies are here. They're in our cities. They're in our towns. They're in our fields. They're in our homes. They're in our lives. And we are not responding by preparing. We're responding by ignoring. And that's where we are today. And so as I researched this and I began to understand through the prophetic word of what the Lord was speaking to me, we need to rise up as Paul reveres of this hour and declare to our people, declare to our family, this is an hour where our enemies are lurking. This is an hour where our enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy. But we act like these are the best days of our lives. We act like there's nothing going on, that everything's fine and everything's going to be wonderful. When the reality is we haven't looked outside to really see our enemies. Are you awake today? The enemy is already here. Paul Revere was not going out telling them that they were necessarily coming. They were already here. He was warning them they were coming out of their positions in order to strike. We know history talks about the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And this was the precursor and the warning for that. And I believe war is here for America if you don't realize and recognize it right now, we are in conflict in all parts of this world. We are a hair trigger away from war in North Korea. We are a hair trigger war away from war in the Ukraine and in Syria and various places that we're sticking our nose into. But we can't find no Paul Revere's. Jeremiah chapter 28. Let's go there. Let's see if we can fix it.
If you don't know where Jeremiah 28 is by now, or the book of Jeremiah, I can't help you. Again, I don't choose these scriptures, believe me. If I was teaching preaching class or in preaching class in some cemetery, they would tell you that's, that's craziness and that ain't the way to preach. <clears throat> but I'm not here for popularity. I'm not trying to build anything other than the kingdom of God. So I want to obey what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. Is that all right? Paul Revere, again, in the spirit of understanding him being a watchman, per se, for the hour of 1775, we need watchmen in the year 2017. We need people who are willing to stare at the faces and declare and decree the word of the Lord, no matter how they may act or respond to you, and even risk your life in trying to win your neighbor for Christ. Jeremiah chapter 28. Are you there yet? And it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azar, the prophet, which was of Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, now first I want you to see this was a meeting of the religious leaders and those people and political power. And Hananiah was a son of. The first thing I want you to write down is be careful of the son of. Y'all catch that later when you're driving home. Be careful of the son of. Those that say they're of. Those that say they are a part of. Those that say that they belong yet have no true pedigree, have no true calling upon their lives. Hananiah was not a prophet. At best, he might have been a priest from the tribe of Benjamin, if you study your history. But it came to pass in the fifth month, and I want you to document that it would have been around August, according to our calendar, that he gathered together the people in the house of the Lord. The first thing I want you to understand and recognize and realize that deception begins in the house of the Lord many times. Deception begins with preachers who will not declare and decree the truth, who will not preach holiness, who will not preach righteousness, and then we allow a nation to do what it wants to do. We allow a church and a community to do what it wants to do. We allow politicians to get away with all kinds of craziness because we can't find preachers with a backbone to say, no, not now, not ever, not on my watch and not over my dead body. You're not going to allow these things to take place in our nation but it happened in our nation when we allowed prayer taken out of school it happened in our nation when we allowed the abortion clinics and the Holocaust to begin in America and really there was no resistance to it and there's really not much resistance now come on somebody if this was the hour of Paul Revere and abortion were the British, he would be sounding the alarm as a watchman should. But we're in that hour right now and we find few that will stand up and say, stop the killing and stop the madness and stop the funding of this in the name of my name, in the name of tax dollars. But deception begins in the house and I believe the condition of this nation and any nation of the world is due to the preachers because preachers preach to people and people run for office and people vote and people have a conscience and people have a moral code and a moral behavior and a moral attitude if preachers were fiery and they were preaching the truth that you would have people full of a pew that were fiery on fire for God and loving the things of God and full of passion but the problem is we have six foot icicles standing behind a pulpit preaching pablum to a bunch of dead people. I wish I had somebody that was my friend this morning. Because that is the reason for our nature. Culture has not taken over our, nat our nation and, and the nature of sin. It, it's not the culture. 
it's because we haven't preached kingdom and infected and, and, and totally brought the nation and the culture to kingdom revelation and living. You know it's the truth. So they came to the house of Lord, the Lord and Hananiah had a message of deception. Verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Watch this now. Here comes Hananiah, the son of. He's not a real prophet. Again, he may be a priest at best. But he gathers them together in the house of the Lord with a message that he said is from the Lord. And he says, in essence, watch it again. He says, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now we know that Jeremiah had said earlier in various chapters that Israel would go into 70 years of bondage. Is that right? It was a prophecy from a man of God, a real man of God, a prophet. But yet the nation did not want to believe the Paul Revere of their hour. They didn't want to believe Jeremiah, Brother Mike, because Hananiah had a good word. Hananiah said that everything's going to keep on rolling and everything's going to be wonderful. And I'm telling you and I'm prophesying to you and I'm standing in the house of the Lord and declaring that we are living our best days. Has anybody heard that before? In essence, what he was preaching to them, he was saying, Israel, you're going to be great again. Israel, everything's going to be fine. Israel, don't worry about your offerings to Moloch where you sacrifice your children. Don't worry about the adultery. Don't worry about the homosexuality. Don't worry about the sin and degradation. Don't worry about all the craziness going on in the house of God. Don't worry about the prostitution in the temple. Don't worry about the thievery of the politicians don't worry don't worry everything's going to be fine we're going to break the king of babylon Amen. the paul revere of their hour jeremiah is sitting there listening to this hananiah who declares deception who declares lies to a people who wanted to have their best day now. They wanted to have the good life. They wanted to have all of these entrapments of life and they wanted appeasement, but they couldn't find someone to speak up until Hananiah came in the room. I believe America and for most part, most of the church has gone back asleep because we have Hananiah standing in the pulpit declaring to you that we're going to break the back of sin. We're going to break the back of the Babylonian king. We're going to turn this whole thing around. We're going to make everything great and we're going to make everything better when the truth is the nation is not getting any better. You don't see anything changing in the, in the area of spiritual reality renewal or restoration things are getting worse by the moment things are getting worse by the day and we believe a lie that all is well I don't know about you but I live in the land of reality I do not live in fantasy island is anybody here today but yet we listen and we gather around preachers who have the Hananiah spirit and we listen to the pablum that they preach and we listen to the lies and we believe that everything can be done well, that all we need is a political answer. And the reality is this, throughout the centuries and history of mankind, there has never been a political solution to a sin-soaked situation. There's never been an answer to sin except the cross of Jesus Christ and his shed blood in the empty tomb. Hallelujah. But we think somehow we're going to legislate righteousness and legislate love. How can you do so without the word as your guide? It's where we are today. Here he is, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts of the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Watch verse 3. Don't miss this. Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, the Nebuchadnezzar, 
king of Babylon took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. Notice this, Hananiah prophesies a political solution. Hananiah didn't say anything about repenting. Hananiah did not call for a nationwide prayer and revival and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. No, he said we're going to have a political revolution that will produce a spiritual restoration. Some of y'all falling asleep on me. He said, we're going to have this political revolution that is going to change everything in Israel. But here's the cool thing, Israel. Here's the cool thing, America. Here's the cool thing, church. You can still sin like you want to sin. You can still do all the stuff you do. You can still watch pornography and still come into the house of God as long as you tithe a little bit. You can still do all these things and we're going to be all right. You see, that's called deception gone to seed. And preachers are preaching right now as I stand behind this sacred desk preaching this truth. They're standing behind their pulpits declaring that you can live any way you want to. As long as you attend church, as long as you have some form of godliness, you're going to be all right. When the reality is, it's not going to be all right because our nation is going to hell. And few preachers want to preach it this morning. But the spirit of Hananiah now. He'll take care of you. The spirit of Hananiah, the prophetic false prophet, if you will, Hananiah, he'll tell you that we're going to flip this thing around and we're going to make things wonderful and we're going to make things powerful. We're going to make things great through a political solution. Verse 3. He said, I'm going to change it all. I'm not only going to bring your king back. I'm not only going to bring the king. I'm going to bring the church stuff back. Watch out for those that tell you that they're going to make everything wonderful in all positions and all parts of society without calling upon the name of Jesus. It's impossible. It's like a man that's lost saying he can get saved on his own and go to heaven. Honey, it's the shed blood of Jesus Christ, confession of the tongue, repentance, and the churning of your life. That's salvation. But we're so duped. We're so enamored by the evangelical powerhouses in America who circumnavigate this nation through the airwaves telling us how to think and telling us how to believe. Honey, I'm going to think and believe the Bible. Amen. I'm going to think and believe the word of God. The Bible declares there is no other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ and a nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. And if you reject me, the Lord says, I will reject you. But this morning, people will believe and choose the Hananiah prophecies that are in this nation today. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about because you're challenged almost on a daily time frame as you speak to friends and families and, for, uh, you know, mis uh, ministry friends or whatever people in your life. And you begin to talk to them about the prophetic and you talk to them about the hour that we're living in and you talk to them about the prophetic realities, buddy, they'll about claw your eyeballs out. I know what I get the letters. People who refuse to see the hour that we're living in because they put their hope in something that is false. They put their hope in man and they hope that everything will turn out. Hope is not a strategy. Absolute truth is a strategy. And so he said, we're going to change this thing. We're going to have a personal revival, man. We're just going to, we're going to make everything spiritually and politically wonderful with a magical political wand. I'm going to tell you something. It scares me when people promise me everything. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? It, it makes me nervous, man, when somebody begins to promise me everything, kind of like a used car salesman. I mean, this is the best car on the lot. I'm telling you, bub. Until you drive off. As is. Verse 4. And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, with all the captivities or the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Again, here is the promise of the Hananiah spirit. I'm going to bring 
your leadership back. I'm going to bring a political solution to you. I'm going to make everything wonderful. I'm going to make everything just perfect. I'm going to put everything in its position. I'm going to make it wonderful. I'm going to make it great. I'm going to make it awesome. I'm going to make it functional. But again, there was nothing that Hananiah said about the sin of the nation. There was nothing in there that brought the revelation of repentance. Watch verse 5. Then the prophet Jeremiah said unto the prophet Hananiah, In the presence of the priests, in the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord, even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. Even Jeremiah said, man, I wish that were so. I mean, wouldn't that be sweet, man, if we lived in a lollipop candy cane type of life where we just clicked our heels and all of a sudden it was wonderful and beautiful and your neighbors loved you and everybody got along at work and nobody honked a horn at you and nobody tailgated? And your mother-in-law called you up and praised you and said, you're the most awesome thing i ever seen, son. You see, that's fantasy. But that's exactly what our preachers are peddling today. That's the deception that they're peddling today. That if we'll just buy into a political solution, if we'll just buy into a movement politically, if we'll just move into a false hope, everything's going to be fine. Honey, I wish you spend more money on revival and prayer than you do burning up jet fuel going back and forth to Washington, D.C. Oh, I've been wanting to say that the longest time. We ought to use that money for world missions. We ought to use that money to build up a 24-hour prayer center where people pray and cry out for God, Amen. not for a politician necessarily. And you can use singular or plural. I don't care. The reality is this, that Jeremiah said, he said, I, Amen. He said, the Lord do so. The Lord perform thy words which thou hast prophesied to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house and all that is carried away captive from Babylon into this place. Jeremiah knew that day would come, but it would come 70 years. And Jeremiah said, amen. I'd love to see it happen like you say in a couple years, but I'm telling you, son, and I'm telling everybody to listen to me, we are going into captivity and we're going to have to deal with it till it's over. And I'm trying to share with the American people, with the church that's awake, we are in captivity and we're going to go farther into captivity and there is not going to be some silver lining at a rainbow that somebody promised you. We're in prophetic reality. This is a day that we're living in. And we must be, as Paul Revere, we must go and tell people and warn them and tell them to prepare for the days that are coming upon us. I'm telling you, you're going to wake up one day and this whole nation will be changed. The whole world will be changed. Then what will you do? You can't prepare for a fire when a fire is burning the house down. But this is America. You have your choice to churn this channel. You've got your choice to tune me out. But the reality is this will come to your neighborhood sooner than you think. Verse 7. Nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears and the ear of all the people. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and evil and of pestilence. So Jeremiah says, let me take you to school there, young whippersnapper Hananiah. And let me just tell you that before you, there were prophets who prophesied of the days of old that would come because of the sin of Israel and the sin of Judah. And I'm standing here today to tell you as Jeremiah was telling Hananiah, that what they said came to pass. And the reality is this, that we're living in such deception that we don't believe the prophetic voices of the past. We don't believe the prophets of the old. We don't believe even modern prophets today who declare judgment on our nation, yet you're watching it outside your window. And it amazes me the disconnect that we have, the complete disconnect from reality because we have hope on some type of false dream. 
Verse 9, the prophet, which prophesies of peace when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and he broke it. Hananiah did not only go in to deceive those that were in authority inside the house of the Lord and those politically. He also stood up against the prophetic voice of God, the appointed prophetic voice of God, which was Jeremiah. And after Jeremiah told him and took him to school and the reality of the prophetic, he took that yoke and he broke it. He took the illustrated sermon, if you will, and he broke it in front of Jeremiah, in front of the nation, and in front of God. How silly we are today that even though you're watching it on your news and you're seeing this whole nation crumble right before your eyes, we are at the precipice of civil war. We are, at, we are the most divided we've ever been in this country. But your prophets prophesied to you that we would be singing Kumbaya by now. Your prophets of prosperity and peace, false peace, they said, we're going to be okay, brother Mike. We're just going to be, this is going to be awesome times of our life. No, what they're going to do is begin to blame it on everybody else instead of receiving the reality that we are a sin-soaked nation. See, I, I'm not getting through to everybody. I'm getting through to somebody, and that's all I came here this morning for because I believe somebody can get the spirit of Jeremiah on them like the spirit of Paul Revere and begin to declare and decree to people that the hour is growing short, that you need to get your life in order, that you need to get your house in order. If we would pursue Christianity and witnessing and evangelism and missions like we're pursuing the political process of this nation, we turn the world upside down. But we're not. We're not because we're, we're sticking up for a candidate, we're sticking up for a person, we're sticking up for people. When I'm telling you it's a waste of your time, it is a waste of kingdom dollars when we should be pursuing this gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me go on. Some of y'all, your fangs are really out. You might trip on your fang on, when you leave, so you might want to get that fang brought up before you, you step on it. Verse 11, and Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations. Man, he wasn't going to do just Israel. He's going to do the whole world. The arrogancy of Hananiah, the arrogancy of our political people today in power, the arrogancy of our people in economical political positions who say we're going to make everything right and turn it all well. Honey, there's got to be an end someday. There's got to be a scenario of the last days and we're watching unfold right before our very eyes. But you want to deny it. So he spake in front of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Sometimes you just got to get out of people's presence. I mean, sometimes you talk to some folk and some people confided in me and they said, Pastor, man, I've been trying to witness to so-and-so and I've been telling them the truth and showing them statistics and showing them reality and they about called my eyeballs out. How I many of y'all can just wave at me and know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you just got to walk away from folk. Sometimes you just got to tuck the truth in your heart and say, okay, I'll be back. Because not everybody's going to believe what you believe until they see what you believe, and then it's too late. And so he went his way in verse 12. Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet. After that, Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying... Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. Notice this. God says, Jeremiah, I'm going to give 70 years of Babylonian captivity to Israel. All they have to do is follow my directions, and I will bring them out on the other side of 70 years, and I'll take care of them. 
I'll bring them back to the land from which I took them from. I'll bring the vessels back, and I will stand as justified and righteous. But the Hananiah spirit says, no, we want to do it our way. We don't want to follow Bible prophecy. We don't believe Bible prophecy. We believe that we can change seasons and times. We believe that we can, through our prayers, we can, we can do anything and manipulate God any way that we want to. And so we're just going to take this yoke and we're going to break it because it is wood and it is breakable. But God said to Jeremiah, because they have done this thing, that which would have been easy for them to go through in 70 years will now become iron to them. It'll be something they can't break off. It'll be something they have to deal with. It'll be heavier in their labors. It'll be a harder upon them because they resisted the change that God said was coming through judgment. And this is what I fear for the church of Jesus Christ today in America and around the world who has listened to and has been infected by the poison of the Hananiah prophecies is that it's going to be harder on you because you would not receive the word of the Lord. You would not receive the prophetic. You would not look outside your window and match the word of God with the reality on the ground. And you refuse to prepare your home. You refuse to prepare your heart. You refuse to prepare your people and prepare your church. And it's going to be harder on you. And that wooden yoke will be iron around your neck. Honey, if I'm going to go into captivity, I'd like to go as easy as possible. Amen. Somebody help me. If I'm going to commit a crime, which I'm not going to commit a crime, I'm not going to do it somewhere in Africa. Y'all are going to catch this later. I'm not going to go to a third world country and commit a crime. If I'm going to commit a crime, I'm going to look for a sign that says protected by the FDIC. Some of y'all catch that later. Y'all ain't with me today. Y'all just thinking about Shonies or something. In other words, I'm going to look for the easy route to do my time. I'm going to look for the easy route to do my captivity. I ain't looking to be shut up in some hole and fed a piece of cheese and some bread every other day with rainwater. I like my six, seven, eight square meals a day. Y'all ain't helping me. Y'all just, just glazed, sugar glazed. Must be near 12. Oh, we got, we got time. Don't you see? And this is the reality, is that people are not ready for what is coming. They're rejecting. They're refusing the Paul Revere's. They're, ref they're refusing the Jeremiah's that are telling you we are teetering on war. We've got enemies all around us. They're here in America right now. Where did the jihadists go? Where did the Muslim Brotherhood go? go? Where did all these other crazy entities and all these aliens and all these people that want to destroy us, where did they go? They're still here waiting on the day of jihad they're here waiting on the day of rage they're here waiting on the orders but yet we dance and prance and parade around like everything's fine in america and this is just great and we stop preparing there's people i know there's churches i know that have stopped preparing and i want to look at them and say you're a fool you're stupid. You're silly. Whatever word you want to use, you have lost your brain. Our enemy is here and they're getting stronger. See, some of y'all, just you're just not with me. And I'm, I'm going to preach for about another hour and I'm going to leave. So I'm going to get this thing out of me one way or the other. There's just one in this room. We are pointing our fingers at nations all across the world trying to pick a fight. We're like the drunk guy at the bar looking at everybody and sizing them up. And he's the smallest dude in the room. Y'all, y'all, y'all too, too holy. You don't remember how Jim Bean to make you seven, eight. Come on, somebody, make vodka, make you spit out fire. And you're the shortest dude in the room, and you don't even have a tattoo.
picking on everybody, looking at them and all this craziness. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're picking fights and we're naked. We're picking fights. We're the shortest in the room. We're picking fights with everybody because we need war in this nation to cover up the sin and to cover up the political corruption that's going on. You're not in the same room with me. But this is exactly what Jeremiah was trying to convey. He said, you're going to make it worse. You're going to make it worse because you're trying to cover it up. God says, I'm trying to heal. God says, I'm trying to bring revival and restoration. But you want to parade politicians. You want to try to use a political solution to fix it. And you can't. It is only the blood of Jesus Christ. It is only the confession of men's sin towards God. It's the only way. And we've lost it because our preachers have become polished and they've become primed and they've become political and they don't want to talk about it anymore. They don't want to declare the truth. Our nation is in trouble, folks. Our nation is in trouble. Here's the thing. Have you not been listening to what they're saying in the news and what politicians are saying that they are going to go to war with North Korea? They've said it. They're baiting you and preparing you and you're going to sit back and rear back on your thumb and pick your nose and say everything's going to be fine. Ain't nobody going to bother us. Ain't nobody going to hurt us. You're crazy. And now I'm in front. So now we're going to be here a while. I ain't scared of you no more, Elder. We sit there and we say, oh man, it's over there and we don't mind if several million get killed over there. We just don't want it to happen here. Honey, they're here now. I'm going to be very blunt. Can I do that? I already gave you all the, your p- potassium iodide the other day and you know, I've already prepared this church. But I'm going to tell you something. Just because they're over there and they're North Korean, it does not mean that those that help them are Korean here. Just like everybody in the mafia doesn't have the last name Gucci. Don't come after me, anybody named Gucci now. Or any mafia. Hmm? But we have this ideal, well, that's over there. Well, I'm going to recognize them because they're going to have a sickler and a hammer. I'm, I'm going to recognize them because they're going to say terrorists on their name tag. Do you know how many people are willing to sell out this nation for a $50 piece of crack? I'm just going to be bare. I'm going to be raw. I don't care. We already got your offering. We just lay it out. Do you know how many people, they sell out our neighborhoods? Do you know how many people would lay their down on their back and spread their legs for just a little bit of money to do something? crazy to this nation but we sit here and we act like it's fine and we don't want to talk about these things preacher we want to stay right here in this little blinder world where we're not going to look to the left we're going to keep plowing we're going to go to work and pay our taxes and keep plowing just little old good old little horsey When the reality is, I'm not plowing for anybody but for the kingdom. I'm plowing for the reality. The blinders are off of me, and I'm trying to wake up people and be a Paul Revere of this hour and be a Jeremiah of this hour and be an Isaiah of this hour and declare to you, you better wake up. You've got an enemy that's not coming. You've got an enemy that's already here. This stuff is scripted. You don't get it. This is scripted. This has been planned out. False flags are coming to this nation. Enemies are here to do the dirty deal. And there are people in power who know this. They're preparing. Can I just be honest with you? This whole thing about the ICBMs and all this with North Korea, they've had the ability to do this a long time before you just know about it. They've got satellites in the air that we know not of what's inside of it. It's all war drums building up, building up the people, building up the, pu- the, the, the public, getting you ready. Now you're starting to hear these things, but in reality it's been going on for a long time. And how you sit underneath, underneath some six-foot icicle giving you some type of Jack Frost theology and not warning and not bringing you to the revelation and the realization of the hours beyond me. 
but people do because they don't want to hear this kind of preaching. They don't like this reality in your face. They just want to stay again in that place where the blinders surround us and we're just having the good old times. Our enemies are here. Our enemies are here. And if they're North Korea, they're not looking like North Koreans. Like I said, they're all types of people that are there and here that are willing to destroy this country. And this is what Jeremiah was saying. Verse 13 again, go and tell Hananiah saying, thus saith the Lord. Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt be made for them yokes of iron. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, that they serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, and I have given him the beasts of the field also." So in other words, he says to them, he said, listen, Hananiah, and all you that want to believe this lie, he said, I've allowed, I've authorized, and I have appointed the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, to do what he needs to do. Today in the American churches, we believe that we have a king, Cyrus, that's in position and power, and I do not believe that is true. I believe we have a king of Babylon. I believe that we're living in an hour when the enemy is going to strike us and we will go into tribulation. In tribulation, I'm talking of great distress. I'm talking about turbulence. I'm talking about all kinds of craziness and all kinds of division and chaos. You say, what? Well, I don't believe it. Honey, we are so divided in the house of God. I feel like the good old denominational days when people would fight over the color of the carpet. But today people are fighting over politics. They're fighting over which way the nation is going. They're fighting over what sins we should deal with and what we should accept. I'm going to tell you something. I have zero tolerance for sin. Zero. I'm not talking about if you make a mistake, we're going to deal with it. We're going to heal you. We're going to love you. We're going to restore you. But I'm talking about those that are out there blatantly sinning and calling it righteous because somebody sanctioned it. And I'm not going into the other sermon, but I sure like to go back to Dr. Dumbbell. I told you I had it in my craw. It ain't left yet. Because the reality is this, that we are dealing with such rampant sin in our country. I told you before, it is so hard to watch the news or turn on the news or put on any type of internet where you get your revelation from. It is so hard to see what is taking place in our country. And then it even boggles my mind even more, Elder, when people tell me, and they say, oh, man, this, this is awesome, and, and things are going to be just fine. You just hold on. I've been holding on, and I'm not holding on to false hope. I'm holding on to the anchor. I'm holding on to the truth of the word of God that only Jesus Christ can save this nation. We're sick. Just recently, Planned Parenthood came out with the new guidelines. Are you ready for this? Can you stomach this? Most church folk are asleep by now anyways. I'm just, I'm just getting started. I feel good now. It's like running, you know, one mile and go ahead and let's do the other five now. That's why I can't go here. I, I just can't go to that church or that pastor. I just tell you. You missed the best at last. Are you ready to go? Planned Parenthood has new guidelines that are out. And they're teaching preschoolers. They're, pre they're teaching preschoolers about sexuality. How old is a preschooler? Is that three to four? We're going to teach preschoolers from the age of three or four years old about sexuality. According to... Planned Parenthood. Most three or four year olds don't even know what they want to eat and they're still picking their nose and eating their boogers. If I offended any preschoolers, I apologize. Pastor loves you. 
but you're nasty. Get rid of that habit. Three to four year olds, they still pee pee in the bed. They can't, if they're boys, they couldn't hit that big old hole. When you teach them how to pee on a Cheerio. See, some, some people can't handle it. Hey, I can't believe he's talking like this. You just ain't had no children or grandchildren in a while. Men still can't do it. Ladies, if you don't know, you need to accidentally walk in a men's bathroom when no one's there. And I wish it were funny, but it's sickening and sad to realize that we got people who believe this, mainstream Christians, mainstream people who believe we should be teaching three to four-year-olds sexuality. There are even guidelines to teach them about masturbation. See, this, this is why I just love kicking your little golden calf. Boom! And watching that day gone break into a thousand pieces. This is your tax money. This is your country being great again. When we teach preschoolers and they have the audacity in their pedophilia guidelines to say, well, they're already touching themselves. They don't know what's going on. You ought to be so mad, but, but you're not. You're not mad. You're not mad. America's not mad. That's why we're not going to have revival. That's why we're going into wreck and ruin. That's why we're going into judgment because we're not mad. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Some of y'all need to change your old toothpaste and get that phosphate between your head out. I'm not getting near being closed, John. I don't know why you're getting up. I'm serious. I, want, I, I, I really need total attention here. This is insanity in America. You can't get much younger than that. You can't touch more, much more innocency than that. What the hell are we doing? Now that ought to get somebody's attention. No, you don't want a father talking to you. You want some pansy preacher that you can just bend over any way you want. Well, you ain't got it here. And if that pisses you off, makes you go, then bye. Don't let the door hit you where the Lord splits you. See, I ain't got to say, I can talk to you all that way. I'm going to get all kinds of letters. I can't believe you talk to those people. <laughs> I can't wait till we get a second camera that shows the faces of y'all laughing, but they freak out. They write me letters. He's killing them. No, I want this to go as far and wide and make it viral. I don't care. Just block me out. Put Stallone's head on me or something. I don't care. Brad Pitt. Just think and hear the word of the Lord. These are preschoolers and we're teaching them about masturbation. This is what they're saying to do. Teach your child about sexuality. It gets worse than that. They say in their guidelines that we should teach them about transgenderism. That they have special counselors. If you think your child is confused about their gender at three to four years old, get a hold of these psychologists who are specialists. And they'll help walk you through your child's change. Freaks is right. You put a Tonka toy or a Barbie doll in front of a boy, he's going to grab the Tonka toy. I know, I've raised boys. My little girl doesn't ask for a G.I. Joe. She wants a Barbie and a horsey. And if my boy were to pick up a doll, I slap the doll out of his hands. Y'all ain't here with me. Teaching them about this transgenderism and gender non-conforming. 
In other words, teaching them they don't have to make a choice. They don't have to be a boy or a girl. They are literally teaching them in the guidelines, listen to this, that not all boys that have a penis are a boy. I'm telling you what it says. Go spend your time and study. No, you're too busy watching your favorite movie, your favorite sports. And they're telling girls that not all girls that have a vagina are a girl. And we're going to make America great again. This is insanity. But we can't find any Paul Revere's. We can't find any Jeremiah's to stand up and say enough is enough. We need revival in America again. We don't need a political revolution. We need revival in America again. We need to cry out to God and say, God, protect the children. Protect the young ones. Because multiplied millions of Americans will follow this ideology. I guarantee you. And even church folks will follow this. Well, I don't want to confuse little Johnny or little Jan. I, I want them just to be what they want to be. We're messed up in America. And we have Hananiahs are parading and polluting around our churches saying everything's fine. No, sir. No, ma'am. I don't see that. I see exactly the word of the Lord coming to pass that there is a yoke of iron upon our neck and it's getting heavier and heavier by the day. Just recently a pastor in, in Ohio was charged for molestation of children that he took them in his office and he molested them for several years. You're going to hear more and more and more reports. We are Babylon folks. I don't care what your favorite preacher tells you or your latest book that you read. We're a sick nation. And some people say, well, we're trying to defund Planned Parenthood and all that. I got that. I'm not talking about defunding them. I'm talking about shutting them down. I'm talking about shutting them down and making them an illegal entity and a terrorist group. They already call them some preachers who preach like this already, already been documented. You know, you, they're terrorists. They're all this. They're anti whatever. Why don't you call it for what it really is and let's shut them places down. I ain't talking violence. I ain't talking stupidity. I'm talking about legal. Shut them down. How can you allow this type of information to be distributed in America under tax dollar money? How do you allow it? And how do we sit in our churches so arrogant and act like everything's fine. Let me finish. I can tell you're done tolerating me. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah, the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest thy people to trust in a lie. Many people today are trusting a lie. They go into the churches, they go out of the churches, and they're full of bondage because of a lie. Verse 16, therefore saith the Lord, behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth this year. Thou shalt die because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died in the same year of the seventh month. So about October, he died according to the Jewish calendar. I don't desire any of these things to come upon America. And if you think that I do, you don't know me. I love this country. I love my family. I love the freedom that I have. I love the ability to go do practically what I want to do in life. I love the fact that I can jump on an airplane and go anywhere in this country or even travel the nations of the world. But I'm going to tell you something. We are ripe for judgment. We are Babylon. We are in serious deep trouble and i'm asking the church to please wake up 
and stop pursuing politics and pursue the prophetic, pursue the word of God, pursue the king and the kingdom. And I'm looking forward to the day when this whole Hananiah prophecy dies in America. It's already dying. Those of you that prophesied and lied about this nation, it's dying right in front of your face. And I wish you'd stop telling the people a lie. One way or the other, God will fix it all. Heavenly Father, help us to be the Jeremiah of the day, the Paul Revere's of the day, who didn't look for claim, a claim or fame or anything like that. They didn't claim no fame. They just were watchmen. I pray my brothers and sisters would do the same. Those that are out there today that are watchmen, I pray that you would energize them, anoint them, appoint them, and give them platforms higher than they already have. For those that are speaking this Hananiah lie, I pray that you would expose them. And I pray this country, Father, would fall on its knees and on its face and seek you. Father, I stand and ask for forgiveness for my nation. Forgive us for what we're doing to these young children, the guidelines that are coming to these parents who know no better because they don't have preachers of righteousness in their lives. Forgive us for not leaving you a heritage or an inheritance with the young children. Forgive us of our sin, Father. Churn our hearts towards you. Father, we love you, we bless you, and I ask for a great move of your spirit on these last days. In Jesus' name, amen. I love everybody. I'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>